Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. On behalf of Water and Waste Digest and our sponsor, Kaiser Compressors, I would like to welcome you to today's presentation titled Understanding Current Blower Technology and Isentropic Efficiency in Blowers. If anyone has questions throughout the presentation, please click the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and enter your question. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our speakers for today's Lunch and Learn session are George Graves, Sales Engineer, Stephen Horn, Blower Product Manager, and Travis Sneed, District Manager, Water and Wastewater Blowers. All right, thank you, Adrienne, and welcome. Uh, on behalf of Kaiser, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. So let's get started. Uh, my name is George Graves, and I'll be your first speaker for today. All right, welcome. Um, here we have from left to right myself, uh, then Stephen Horn in the middle, and Travis Sneed to the right. Let's get started with the type of blowers available in today's wastewater treatment market. All right, choices, choices, choices. It could be a daunting task when choosing a blower technology for your project. Whether it be replacing a single blower, replacing all of your blowers, or even designing a whole new plant, you'll find yourself asking, how do you choose between the different types of blowers available? Well, that's exactly where you need to start because there are advantages and disadvantages to each technology that can each be effective and applied appropriately. Blowers are such a crucial component to the wastewater treatment system, so it is important to take the time to find the best technology for your intended application. Today, we will talk briefly about some of the most common technologies so that at the end of this presentation, you will have some direction on which technology fits your project best. As mentioned, there are many different blower technologies available, but we, fo we will focus on just a few of them today. First, we'll break this down into two different categories, dynamic blowers and positive displacement blowers. For dynamic blowers, we typically see multi-stage centrifugal and turbo blowers. Multi-stage centrifugal blowers are one of the older technologies that has been around for decades and has been the workhorse of many plants around the world. Turbo blowers are a newer technology that has really taken off over the past 10 years with improved bearing and motor technology. Positive displacement blowers include your typical rotary lobe and rotary screw blowers. The rotary lobe blowers are also an older but proven technology that has been the heart of countless wastewater treatment plants around the world. Rotary screw technology is similar to turbo blower technology in that it is a relatively newer technology when compared to rotary lobe and multi-stage blowers. Now let's get into further detail about what makes these blower technologies different from each other and where they are best utilized. First, let's quickly talk about the difference in flow characteristics between dynamic and positive displacement blowers. Dynamic blowers use kinetic energy to create pressure by slinging air in a way similar to how a slingshot shoots a walnut. Imagine this walnut being shot out of the slingshot and then hitting the wall. The resulting pressure is from the kinetic energy of the walnut converting the, to potential energy upon impact. Now for positive displacement, imagine a nutcracker. Before you close the jaws of the nutcracker onto the nut, there is no pressure. However, once the nutcracker touches the nut, the pressure starts to build and you can crack the nut. The pressure is a result of the compression of the nut, not kinetic energy. Now let's relate this to blowers. As mentioned before, multi-stage and turbo blowers use kinetic energy to generate pressure. The kinetic energy being the velocity of the air in this case. The air will enter the blower and be ejected off the end of the impeller, similarly to the walnut being flung out of the slingshot. The air will travel at this high velocity until it hits something, let's say the water in an aeration basin, where it will recreate the resulting pressure. These blowers can be offered in a single stage with an integrated gearbox as a multi-stage in which pressure increases with each stage or directly coupled to a shaft and run at very high speeds. Although there are a few dynamic blower styles, the flow characteristic remain largely the same. The flow can be controlled either by throttling a valve or using a variable frequency drive. One thing that needs to be considered when using a dynamic blower is surge, which is when air flows backwards into the air end. This can damage the air end and lead to premature failure. We will take a look at some performance curves in just a bit to show you what the surge line looks like. These dynamic blowers are often preferred at larger municipalities due to their ability to generate large flow rates. Smaller plants can also see benefits to these blowers due to their minimal maintenance and longevity of service. Now let's talk about rotary lobe blowers. 
The rotary lobe blowers traditionally come in two or three lobe configurations. A three lobe configuration is shown here. Rotary lobe blowers use what is called isochort compression or more commonly known as external compression. This means that the blower will push a fixed volume of air on each rotation of the rotors and will only build as much pressure as there is resistance. If there is no back pressure, for instance, when there's no water in an aeration basin, there will be little to no pressure. This is why the rotary lobe blowers are considered to be adaptive. One limiting factor associated with lobe blowers is the gap between the rotor and the housing. These gaps allow a certain amount of backflow through the blower known as slip. The larger the gaps, the higher the slip and the higher the operating temperatures. Although these gaps limit the performance of a blower, improvements in manufacturing techniques over the years have reduced these gaps to maximize performance. In conclusion, rotary lobe blowers are proven workhorses in the wastewater market known for their simplicity, durability, and reliability. Last but not least, we have rotary screw blowers. Rotary screw blowers utilize internal compression. This compression is generated by ingesting air into one side of the blower, compressing that air between a male and female rotor and discharging it on the opposite side. Due to this internal compression, there's always a minimum pressure present. This can lead to over compression of the air if the internal, if the internal compression exceeds the required system pressure. This, however, is uncommon as the minimum operating pressure is usually less than five PSIG. These blowers are simple and dependable, just like a rotary load blower, but benefit from the improved efficiency achieved through internal compression. This improved performance typically comes at an increased price over the rotary lobe options, but they are often cheaper than the dynamic machines. Also, when comparing rotary lobe to rotary screw at the same flow range, the rotary screw blower is generally one motor nameplate smaller. This will occasionally result in the screw blower being even cheaper than a comparable lobe blower. Now let's talk a little bit more about the performance of these technologies. For now, we'll just talk about the two most efficient technologies, that is the high-speed turbo blower and the rotary screw blower. The graph shown here is a graph of the isentropic efficiency versus volume flow. We'll get more into what isentropic efficiency is in just a minute, but for now, let's just consider this to be the overall efficiency of the blower. As you can see here, the turbo blower is more efficient at what we call a sweet spot. This is the peak point in the performance curve in which the turbo blower is more efficient than the screw blower. On the other hand, if we look at the screw blower performance curve, we can see that the efficiency remains more consistent over the control range of the blower. This should be considered when choosing your blower technology because it is likely that the blower will not always run in that sweet spot where the turbo blower is most efficient. However, if you are sure that your application will always demand a flow that keeps it in its peak efficiency, a turbo blower could be a great choice. One more thing to consider is that with a rotary screw blower, you will enjoy traditional maintenance similar to that of a rotary lobe blower. Turbo blowers have minimal maintenance. However, when repairs do come up, they can be costly due to complicated bearing and motor technologies. Now let's take a look at control range. Once again, focusing on screw and turbo blowers. Here we have the screw blower control range in yellow and the turbo blower control range in blue. Let's take a look at the turbo blower control range first. I've drawn two red lines on the graph to show two different operating pressures for the turbo blower. They are drawn from the surge line on the left to the maximum flow limit on the right at two different operating pressures. As you can see, the operating pressure has a large influence on how much flow the turbo blower can deliver. As you increase your pressure, your flow range gets much smaller. On the contrary, if we look at the screw blower, I can change the operating pressure and the flow range remains largely unaffected. In conclusion, if the pressure is fairly consistent, a turbo blower can be a great choice. However, if the pressure has large fluctuations, a screw or low blower might be a better choice. Now let's touch on a few more aspects that should be considered when weighing your options. The first is the electrical consumption of the blower. This should be the total package input kilowatt, not just the motor power. This includes the VFD, vent fan, and any other electrical consumptions of the unit. This, this will be important in deciding the annual power cost. This leads me to my next point, know your power cost. Power costs will vary depending on where you live. For instance, in Hawaii, power costs can exceed 24 cents per kilowatt hour, so it would make sense to get the most efficient blower and capitalize on the energy savings. In an area where energy cost is closer to 5 cents per kilowatt hour, it might make more sense to go with the cheaper option after considering your return on investment. This goes hand in hand with specific power, which you could think about like miles per gallon in your car. 
It's not always what you use to decide when buying a car, but it is something you would consider. Lastly, consider your load hours. Is your blower running 24 seven or are you using it in a filter backwash application that only runs for short periods at a time? This could negate any energy benefits you might see from a higher efficiency blower. Now let's move on to my last slide and wrap up current blower technology. In conclusion, there are many different factors that need to be considered when deciding on a blower technology. What's your application? Is it aeration, digesters, filter backwash? Compare your investment costs, operating costs, and service costs with the purchase price of the blowers. Keep in mind that the most efficient blower is not always the right choice once your return on investment is considered. Today, we only skimmed the surface, but feel free to reach out to me with any questions you may have. With that, I'll pass off the mic to Stephen Horn to talk about isentropic efficiency. Okay, thank you, George. Let me get my part of the presentation up. All right, George, thanks so much for going through that. Let's take a moment to, to talk a little bit more about isentropic efficiency. It was mentioned by George, but we'll take a little bit uh, deeper dive into it. As mentioned earlier, my name is Stephen Horn, and I am the Blower Product Manager for KZUSA. And like I said before, we're going to talk here about isentropic efficiency. So isentropic efficiency is a metric that can be used to compare blower packages. As uh, seen by the equation on the screen, it is a ratio of your theoretical power consumption to your actual power package consumption. Actual power consumption is always greater because the losses within the blower itself, as well as the other items required to operate the blower complete package. So packages aren't just the errands, there's other things that come with it. And you can see a few of them listed on the screen here. EG's items uh, represent some loss of power, flow, pressure, and more importantly, heat. To accommodate for these losses, the unit must work harder to meet the demand or the flow that you're requesting from the unit. And in doing so, its actual power consumption will drift further and further away from the ideal or theoretical machine. So to determine isentropic efficiency, uh, we need to know two numbers. The first is this isentropic power that you saw on the previous formula, and of course, the actual power. For the isentropic power, you can find this formula in most any thermodynamic book. Uh, you can derive it or even uh, on the internet, or as it specifically relates to a low pressure compressor and or blower, as they're called, um, these standards mentioned here uh, will we'll lead you through that. Each of them demonstrate how to calculate your isentropic power and the process of doing so. Again, this is the ideal process, and this is not what you should expect from the actual machine. As we saw in the previous slide, the actual machine has other components uh, required to run the unit, therefore increasing the machine's actual power consumption. So with any given set of conditions, you can find your ideal machine. And that was the, what was mentioned on the previous slide using the standards mentioned. Next, you can evaluate the actual unit by measuring the actual machine power consumption. So of course, this requires a unit uh, to be in operation uh, for to take a measurement. And where you take this measurement is important as you want to be certain that you account for all these items um, which are required to operate the machine. Once you have these two values, then you can calculate your isentropic efficiency. Now, isentropic efficiency and uh, machine power consumption can also be given to you by the manufacturer. Uh, this is also outlined in the previous standards. And then the manufacturer can provide you both a theoretical, or you can calculate the theoretical, um, and then they can also provide you what the package power consumption will be. And again, we'll make sure we grab that as far up line uh, to make sure we're capturing all the items in a package for power consumption. So now that you have these values, 
and now you have the efficiency, it can be a useful metric to compare machines um, from type to type and even across uh, technologies. Uh, most technologies have a similar efficiency values. So we've talking low blower to low blower, screw blower to screw blower, and high speed turbo blower to high speed turbo blowers. Those efficiency values will be very similar, but the, there can be rather dr dramatic variations across the control range. So in the end, uh, you wanna make sure you're taking uh, a full look at this and essentially, the more efficient the machine, this is an obvious statement, but the more efficient the machine, the more savings that you will realize. However, uh, the more efficient machines often cost more to purchase. Uh, George also mentioned power, uh, how much you pay for power utility. That also varies dramatically, and this can also impact how much uh, savings that you will realize. So always model your system as best as you're able and to uh, get the best sense of your potential savings. Okay, so this was my section on isentropic efficiency. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to Travis Sneed, who's going to talk to us a little about uh, tips for uh, putting all this into practice. Travis? All right, thank you, Stephen. I appreciate it. So my name's Travis Sneed, and I'm the district manager for the water and wastewater aeration blowers. Now we're gonna walk through five tips and tricks to assess your current blower system. So step one is to always consider newer technologies. As George noted earlier, rotary screw blowers will usually be one nameplate horsepower smaller than traditional lobe in multi-stage centrifugal technologies. This makes insulation a breeze since you are able to reuse the existing electrical infrastructure. Many times you can bypass the existing starter, install a new fuse disconnect at the point of use and hit the start button since the VFD is factory wired. Step two is to estimate your potential savings. Screw and turbo blowers can reduce the annual power consumption by you know, 20 to 30% depending on the process. Knowing that new integrated technologies cost between $1,000 and $1,500 per horsepower, we can ballpark park the return on investment for this upgrade. Looking at the example to the right, if your power annual power bill is around $100,000 a year, chances are you stand to save between $20,000 and $30,000 a year with this new technology and little bit of automation. Assuming the existing equipment on site is 100 horsepower, chances are you're gonna need 75 horsepower uh, screw blowers. Uh, knowing that the capital cost for this new technology is between $1,000 and $1,500 per horsepower, we can get an overall capital cost of between $150 to $225,000 for that equipment purchase alone. That equates to a re return on investment for between five and 11 years. So step three is to refine your estimates. If your ballpark estimates are appealing, take a closer look. To do this, you need to find the original design conditions. Operating pressure and airflow are the main drivers of purchase price and operation costs. Note how many blowers you use and what speed they're running at. You may not need to replace all of the blowers at once. If you leave an existing unit for backup, you can reduce your overall capital costs and return on investment. If the design conditions are nowhere to be found, consider an air demand analysis. Here, Kaiser can connect data logging equipment to measure the airflow, operating pressure, kilowatt consumption, and operating temperatures. With this information, we can effectively size a new station for your process with your current demand in mind and re revise the estimated energy savings. Also, be sure to call your power company. Many times they're in incentives available for these high efficiency purchases. This will further reduce the return on investment for the planned upgrade. Step five, or step four, sorry, jumping ahead, is to call a contractor or two. The installation of a blower station can easily match or exceed the purchase price of the new equipment. Let's say it is an 11 year return on investment before installation. After installation, the return on investment could easily be out to 22 years. 
with the design life of most equipment being 20 years, this project is no longer justifiable. Contractors have experience and understand where cost savings can be achieved. Meet with the contractor to discuss the selected technology, capabilities of the, that technology, your personal preferences, and the overall installation requirements. After getting the installation estimate, you may need to refine your design with installation in mind. At this point, you will have most of the information you need to prioritize the upgrade. If you can save $50,000 a year on a $100,000 purchase, it is your civil duty to see this through. Call the town manager or engineer as they will be able to assist with the rebates, bid documents, and financing as needed. However, many rural towns may not have access to these services. If that is the case, reach out to your local rural water association. Rural water targets small systems serving populations of 10,000 and less. As a nonprofit, they have access to tools and funding programs that could assist in your next project. With wastewater, water, and energy efficiency technicians, they can provide a wealth of knowledge and experience. Many times they can even identify cost savings without capital purchases. And remember, each year you wait, you're losing money and increasing the cost of the equipment. In closing, by starting with Kaiser, you know that your aeration blower upgrade will be within budget. As the industry leader in aeration blower technology, you can always find cheaper, less efficient component type solutions. These component type solutions with remote mounted VFDs are like purchasing a kit car versus, versus purchasing a new car from the dealership. There is the potential to save money if you know what you're doing, but you're allowing many unknown variables into your project. So why take the risk when you can purchase an integrated solution that does not require a third party PLC or remote mounted VFDs and is guaranteed to work upon delivery? Always remember, when you remove the VFDs from the blower package, you are not saving money. You're just shifting the cost to the installation and increasing the risk, risk of installation errors and then fighting over who's responsible. Many times, the added installation cost and liabilities will outweigh any personal preference. So that wraps up our presentation. Uh, for more information, including additional resources to help with your next project, visit us online. Um, I believe we have some time for some questions. Um, Stephen, did we get any? Uh, thanks, Travis. Uh, yeah, there's a couple questions on here. We'll go through them uh, if everybody has some time. Um, the first question is, uh, you briefly mentioned bearing technologies when talking about turbo blowers. Can you talk a little bit more about those? I think I'll I'll leave that to George to answer. George? Yeah, no problem. Uh, the two main technologies being used in high-speed turbo blowers today uh, are typically airfoil and magnetic bearing technologies. Airfoil bearings use a cushion of air to float the rotor of the blower, uh, whereas ma magnetic bearings use magnetic fields to center in the, uh, the rotor and facilitate a, a nearly frictionless rotation of the shaft. Um, airfoil bearings are usually the cheaper option, but have limited starts and stops per hour due to contact between the shaft and rotor on startup and shutdown. Um, they are usually more sensitive to contaminants um, in harsh environments, such as a dusty plant or using them outside. Um, due to this, they need highly filtered air. Um, additionally, air bearings are often required to idle to maintain a film of air and keep the rotor elevated. Um, that's not required when you have magnetic bearings because a rotor can be held stationary by the magnetic fields created. Uh, magnetic bearings are typically a little more expensive, uh, but they do offer um, the benefit of having a sealed motor housing. So you don't have to worry about contaminants in the air. So they're a little bit better for harsh environments. Uh, magnetic bearings are also um, good because they have unlimited starts and stops due to there being no contact between the rotor and the housing. Um, so as you can see, there are pros and cons to each bearing technology. Uh, so it's just really important to do your research uh, if you plan to purchase a turbo blower. Okay, thanks, George. Here's another question. Uh, at what flow range do you consider switching from PD to turbo? Um, Travis, you wanna take that? Yeah, that's a little tricky question because it really um, depends.
depends on the process and the manufacturer you have in mind. But most of the time, you're able to you know, justify you know, turbo technology over PD technology you know, once you're getting above that 3000 CFM range. Now, um, depending on the operating pressures and the uh, f- you know, airflow requirements for your process, you know, a screw blower may be cheaper, may be more efficient, but um, Kaiser, we offer screw blowers up to about a uh, little over 5,000 CFM. Um, but for most, most applications, you know, Turbo blowers and screw blowers, these high efficiency technologies should be considered, you know, around 3000 CFM and higher. Okay, thanks, Travis. There's a question here. Are, are centrifugal blowers multi stage? And I guess that the answer to that question is centrifugal blowers are dynamic blowers. And dynamic or centrifugal blowers, there's multiple, several different types of those. You have uh, geared turbos, um, you have high-speed turbos, and then the multi-stage is a type of centrifugal or type of dynamic machine. So the answer is yes, um, but there are different types of uh, centrifugal uh, machines. Um, Here's another question. Um, Which type of blower is less noisy? I think that's a, uh, a tricky question because um, from a DBA standpoint, I think that, you know, depending upon how you fit the enclosure uh, that the blower is installed in, will really determine the noise and the attenuation efforts taking place. Um, most blowers, I think this, at this day and age, the package is somewhere in the low 70s. Some even uh, get into the high 60s. Um, and the turbo manufacturers are advertising in the high 60s, low 70s. Um, so I think that uh, even the screw blowers, many screw blower packages are in the low 70s. So I think it kind of depends upon uh, how that piece of equipment is packaged. Um, next question here is, can you provide maximum pressure at minimum speed with PD blowers? George, you wanna try that one? Sorry about that, I was muted. Uh, Maximum pressure at minimum speed. And uh, you said that was for, I'm sorry, screw or lube? All right, sorry about that. Um, The next question here is isentropic efficiency. This thing just moved on me. Is isentropic efficiency more or less the same with in each blower category and can you use some idea of efficiencies for low multi-stage and screw blowers. So uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, many of them are essentially the same within the technology and depending upon which technology you're talking about. So turbo blowers are often said to have isentropic efficiencies that are peaked probably in the low 80s. Uh, Screw blowers typically in the, in the high 70s can maybe touch uh, the low 80s. Um, for low blowers and multi-stages, they're pretty similar. Um, and those can be in the, the 60s and high 50s. So typically you'll say your screw or turbo technologies can be 25 to 30% over um, your lobe and multi-stage uh, units. All right, I think we have time for one more uh, question. Uh, can you mix and match multiple technologies, turbo, PD, or turbo with screw? And the answer to that is it depends. Um, this uh, is mainly to do with the type of bearings that you have in your different technologies. Now for your PD machines, typically mixing them is not such an issue. Uh, they have your traditional roller elements um, and they can withstand any uh, pulsations or vibrations within the pipeline. When you get to turbo blowers, um, I would strongly suggest that you talk to your supplier that you're working with. Um, typically with a magnetic bearing on the turbo, this is not an issue because the uh, the magnetic bearing controller 
is measuring the shaft position and has the ability to respond to the potential pulsations from your PD equipment um, and keep the shaft uh, centered. With airfoil turbo technology, um, now the bump foils on these have come a very long way in more recent years, but uh, for the pulsations in theory, could cause that shaft to move and impact the, the bump on the turbo. So uh, I don't wanna speak for all turbos, and I would suggest that you talk uh, with your uh, potential turbo supplier on that to make sure that this wouldn't be an issue. And of course, uh, within the PD market, you should be fine, but you know, two lobe blowers have more, stations, more pulsation energy than three lobes, and three lobes have more pulsation energy than screws. Okay, well, I do not see any other questions coming in. Um, I thank uh, everybody for attending. Um, the presentation, um, uh, the recording of the presentation, as well as these slides will be available to you from the uh, link that's noted here on this slide. Um, so uh, again, thanks everybody for coming out and I wish everybody a wonderful afternoon and hope to talk to everybody soon. Uh, thanks again, bye-bye. Okay, that wraps up our time for this event. On behalf of Water and Waste Digest and our sponsor, I would like to thank everyone for their participation. Stay tuned for additional events. We hope you stay informed and stay well.